All right, so going once, going twice, going three times. Into today's content we go. Now, as you're aware, we finished all the slide decks for the first half of the term, which was one to five. And as we all experienced last week's lecture, the slides for topic number five, which was normalization, were not exactly ideal. Therefore, I am going to go through the normalization process from start to end. I'm even going to diagram it on the board from start to end. So it's pretty much what, you know, what the assignment is going to look like for you guys. Kind of. With data totally unrelated to the assignment. So what I'm going to do, and I know the people that brought back probably can't read that whiteboard. Sorry. I've only, I can only write so big and still fit everything on, on one board. We have a batch of unnormalized data. So what I'm going to go do is um, rule by rule, I will identify um, what defines first, second, and third normal form, and then I'll transform that into each of the normal forms. After the very first step, I won't be referring to the data in it anymore because the data in it will be irrelevant. But for starters, I'm going to identify two issues with this and show you guys at least how to get it up to the first normal form. And then I'll write the description of the rule on that board that rolls around. Okay, so currently as it stands, this can be considered unnormalized, also known as 0NF, zero normal form. It's zero normal form because of Three reasons. Actually, I want one more marker. And the reasons are as follows. No primary key identified. That's because it's zero and F. There's no primary key. There is repeating groups of columns. It's this chunk right here. Okay. okay. Repeating group of columns. The last one, which we didn't have in the other example that we we're working with, is this section here. In here, you can see there's a comma delimited PHP comma SQL. This is known as a multi-valued attribute. In other words, there's a single column, but there's multiple values in it. So on this board, valued attribute. So to write out what first normal form stands for, Primary key is defined. No multi valued attributes. and no repeating groups of columns. So that's the official definition of first normal form without all the extra words that were on like three slides. When I'm done, I will be taking pictures of this and posting it to the announcements so that, you know, people at the back that can't read the board are gonna be good. So how do we fix some of these issues? Fixing this one is pretty easy. We just populate the entire row. So that's the starting point. So I'm going to take a picture of that. So I've got a picture of the starting point.
So I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to fix is the repeating groups of columns because that's the really bad one. So I don't want this in here anymore. And how do you fix that? You just populate the entire row. Okay. So now we don't have repeating groups of columns because the entire row has been populated. So that one's an easy fix. This one is not so easy. And I'll address that in a moment. Now, first thing we're gonna to try to do at least is to find a, our candidate key or our primary key. It's gonna be a combo key. And when we look at it, we have a few potential options. So we have the project number, which seems to define over here. We've got a timesheet entry, which seems to define this stuff. We have an employee number, which seems to match the timesheet entry. So we have a few options, but normally when you're trying to find out a candidate key, you try to find the fewest number of elements or attributes that will do the job. So we know for a fact the project number is good to go. So we're going to add that to our candidate key. And over here we have our timesheet entry and our employee number. So then we can look at the rest of this data and we can think, okay, well, the hours, is that specific to the employee or the timesheet entry? Well, technically, it's both at the same time because each timesheet entry is for a specific employee. However, really, hours implies timesheet, not employee. So we're going to go with the least number of potential attributes, and we're going to say timesheet entry plus project number will give us our candidate key. So candidate key is blue. So now we have one last problem. And it's our wonderful friend in orange. Because we're still not in first normal form because we still have multi-valued attributes. We have to get rid of the multi-valued attributes. The way you fix it is you break out the multi-valued attributes into its own table. At this point in time, we don't, or I shouldn't say a table, its own entity at this point in the game. Now we look at this data and figure out, well, if we're going to pull this out, how are we going to connect it to the rest of this? So we have to think about skills. Does it have anything to do with the project? No. Does it have anything to do with the person's salary? Well, theoretically, yes, but no. It has nothing to do with their name, but maybe the skills are tied to the employee number. Now the employee number is not part of a primary key. However, it seems to identify a person, including their set of skills. So I'm like, okay, oops. I forgot to fill that in. So, so this, you know, is like, seems to be employee number. So what we're gonna do is we'll take this, break it up to its own entity, and I'll put up a single example. So I'm gonna grab employee number, and skill and employee number six seven eight php sql i might as well do nine eight seven two while i'm at it and that's c sharp now what we've done is we've broken it out into its own thing so it doesn't need to be here anymore so now our main set of data is still intact. We have not lost any information. The only thing we have to do now is identify our candidate key in that piece that we broke out. And this is that this this particular one is the grossest step when dealing with normalization is when you get a multi-valued attribute because it has to go away before you start the normalization process. But the fact is by making it go away, you're actually taking a step on the normalization path because you're breaking things apart. Oh, shoot. Thanks.
There, that's better. All right, so we needed to identify the candidate key for this potential thing, which at this point in time seems to be an employee number plus a scale, so the combo of the two will give us, well, a candidate key. So at this point, this can be said to be in first normal form. So I'm going to rewrite this in the normalization syntax over here so you can see where it's going. So, so oh, and you guys can't see it, but that says one and F first normal form. Okay, so that rewritten in the normalization for syntax, you want to, for the lack of a better word, is that. So once we exclude the data and we've identified the candidate keys, got rid of repeated groups of columns and gotten rid of multi-valued attributes, we have this setup. Sort of straightforward. It's not a big thing. All we're trying to do is getting rid of repeating things and or empty things. Yeah, I took out the entire column and I turned it into its own thing. The one that had what was called multi-valued attributes. Uh, multi-valued attributes multi-valued attributes are basically lists. And a repeating group of columns is a columns that are basically repeated without the entire row. Okay. And just so I can write down on here how to fix it. And that's as you can't see it elsewhere. The fix is for the multi-value to move it to its own entity. The fix for repeating column the rows is you fill out the rest of the row. Yes, I will post these pictures in order as I went through the process. Okay, so what's next? Now we got to define what second normal form is.
You know, it's a really awkward height to write at. And no partial dependencies. That's the definition, definition of second normal form. Okay. So what is a partial dependency? It's when an attribute depends on only part of the key. All right, our partial dependencies are going to be purple. So when we look at this stuff here, we're going to look at it and say, okay, we're going to look for our full dependency and our partial dependencies. A full dependency is a good thing. So we're going to start with that. So actually, we'll start with our partials first. Okay, employee salary, employee name, and employee number has nothing to do with the project. Therefore, these are only partially dependent on part of the primary key. So far, it looks like it's dependent on the timesheet entry. I wrote too high on the board. The project description seems to only depend on the project number. It has nothing to do with the hours. So these are our partial dependencies. And we do have a full dependency, which is what we want, which is our hours. Is fully dependent on the primary key. So for me to put in my little colored legend again, to continue with you know, the color coding. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna put my colored legend over here. I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Okay, so we've identified our partial dependencies and our full dependencies. How do we fix the partial dependencies? Anybody want to take a stab at what you do with the partial dependencies? You break them out into its own entity. You know, I just can't look at it that way. Hey, yeah, I will be on. I'm actually going to scooch it over here because I don't need this oof whiteboard for the time being. And I'm making the visibility even worse to the people on this side. OK. As David said, how do you fix partial dependencies? You move it to its own entity. You're going to see a, a repeating pattern here in how we handle problems. So we are going to put this in second normal form now that we've identified our partial dependencies. So we're going to go OK, we know there's a timesheet entry.
we have our project employee, let's call it. We have project which has a project number and a project description. And we had our last table here, which has not changed. Okay, so this is second normal form. Can somebody tell me why employee skills did not change? Anybody? Anybody not shy? Okay, I'll answer. It's because it's already in third normal form. You don't change something if it's already in third normal form. Because this one just so happens to be to only have two columns, both columns are part of the primary key. There's nothing else we can do with it. So it is officially in second normal form. Now, forgot a little box over here. You'll notice at no point am I calling this a primary key because it's not. Okay, second like normal form. I'm going to take another picture of the board before I continue on because I'm going to move over here. I'm going to put it over here for now. I'll move it out of the way in a second. Okay, so. I, you know what I really miss about this room? Before they redid this room, we used to have some that would go up. So I could have written this and then sent it up high. So you guys could keep it all on one board. Now I'm stuck with wheel around. Okay. The definition for a third normal form is it has to be in second normal form. There's a surprise. And In third normal form, it has to be in second normal form and no transitive dependencies. Notice I haven't finished filling out the, the red and the green explaining what the bad thing is and how to fix it yet. I will in a moment. Okay, so a transitive dependency is defined as follows. It is when 
An attribute's value is determined by another attribute, also known as an identifier, but that identifier is defined by an other identifier. So when we look at this, our unhappy candidate for this is going to be our project employee because the employee name is determined by the employee number and the salary. And the employee number depends on the timesheet entry. So why is it called a transitive dependency? I've looked it up over the years as to why they use the word transitive. And the only explanation that came up that makes sense in plain English is to find the primary key for these values, you have to transit through another one. So you go this to here, here to there. So this is identified by this, and this is identified by that. The second, you have to say this is identified by twice when pointing out a piece of data. That's a transitive dependency. So this piece is identified by transiting through an identifier that is not part of the primary key. And it comes over here. So now I'm going to write the definition of what the transitive is. The transitives also have the longest definition, even though it's a pretty straightforward concept. So a transitive dependency is an attribute identified by an attribute that does not in the key. Um, an actual fact, I'm going to add a word in front of this, make it clearer. Okay, let's reread that. An attribute identified by an identifier slash attribute that does not participate in the key. So when we look at this one right here, we can see the employee name and employee salary is identified by the employee number. Employee number does not participate in the key because it depends on something else. Okay. Now for the green ink. How do you fix that? Make another entity. Okay, you, you fix it by moving the transitive dependency into its own entity, but you do leave behind the identifier as a foreign key. Now I'm going to move it so people on this side can actually read it. Before I'm, I'm going to go erase this board so that I can finish over here. eraser really hates my orange marker. Nice. Smear central. Yeah, that's great. That's going to be good for my marker tips. How about this one? And it's doing absolutely nothing. Okay, great success. All right, so I am going to put down one more color on my 
little legend here. I'm going to take a picture of my board nicely colored up because we're going to do third normal form, but there'll be almost no colors on the third one. All we'll have is blue and green and none of the bubblegum colors. Okay. Now I'm going to move this back over here. So now we're going to try to get this into third normal form. Should be fairly straightforward because we only have one job left. So we're going to start with project time. Because that one's in third. We have. That's really the stupid name I gave that table. Actually, let's go. Uh, I can't even do a green on that, that one because it's self-referencing. So in the end, we took our less than ideal table structure and turned it into one, two, three, four. There should be one more. What am I missing? Oh, project. Oh, Dan. Okay, I'm going to add one more color to this. For everybody's enjoyment.
Why can I not write foreign key without having to write it three times? Okay, I decided to in here just highlight which ones were the foreign keys by underlining them in brown so you know where their data is coming from. Normally, you don't even do any underlining and this kind of stuff except for the Canada keys. Okay, so we've gone from that grid of data down to a series of normalized entities. We have five of them. And I'm going to take my pictures so that, you know, everything is fully up to date. So that we have the full set of colors when I post this. Okay, so, so far so good. Everything, all the different things are explained. All the normal forms are explained. So almost sort of clear. Yes, it's not 100% clear because, you know, you need to do it a few times to really get a handle on it. But this is about as plain English as I can make it without needing 51 slides of definitions. Now, what am I going to do next? I am going to take that and turn it into a conceptual diagram. Why? Because you guys should see what it looks like. It's its only purpose why we're going to do it. So I am going to erase this board. Yeah, I took a picture. this into a standard, sorry, an extended ERD because we're going to show the, the entities and how things are related. First things first, we're going to do our um, do our employee table, which has An employee number and name, and if I'm right, yeah, the outside most row here doesn't see what I just wrote. Sorry, guys. Um, you'll see how it's going to get done elsewhere. It's all good. So then we have um, projects. I'm going to put projects over here. And I am going to do use timesheet employee. Okay, let's go. Uh, timesheet employee. And for the conceptual diagram, I don't actually need to take in the foreign keys. And for this, I need just the one entry. Like that. And we have the project time. which has hours. And the last one we have is employee skills. So 
So what I haven't done yet is the cardinality. Yes. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. There you go. There, now we're complete. So what's missing right now is the... Um, relationships. And I'm going to introduce you guys to a few uh, symbols that you may not have seen on the slide. The double box means it's a weak entity. It cannot exist without its parent. So that's, when you see a double box, that probably means that the primary key is being carried in from the other one. So if we look at the time employee, same deal. Uh, it's weak because the employee comes in. In actual fact, I'm going to add on its missing one because I was missing one for that too, which is the... Uh, Timesheet entry, like such. And project time is also weak because it cannot exist without either of these two. So those are weak entities. Now we need to think about our, our cardinality. So I'm assuming an employee can have multiple skills. Makes sense. You don't want to hire someone that can only do one job. Can you imagine if you worked at McDonald's and all you could do is put fries in and out of the grease all day because that's the only skill you've been given? That's kind of disingenuous because literally that's almost what McDonald's makes you do. But anyways, um, we can go and assume that an employee has multiple skills and probably must have at least one skill. Otherwise, why the heck did you hire them? And each skill must be assigned to one and only one employee in this case, because that's just how our data ended up working out. Um, there is a much better way of doing this, which I might bring up in a minute. So employee time entries. Odds are an employee can have multiple time entries. Could theoretically have no time entries. Yes. Each time entry is for one and one employee. Um, project time. You only log time for one project at a time, but each project can have multiple time entries and they may not have any yet because it's a new project. And same thing with this side of the deal, but this one's going to be mandatory because there's no point. So now we've filled in our cardinalities. So we took that and turned it into this. At that point in time, you should be able to use that to explain to your manager what's happening. Your manager might not understand that, but there's pictures. That's very likely going to help. All right, I'm going to take a picture of this. And now I'm going to convert that to a physical diagram. I should have made it more that way. But that's okay. And eraser. I'm happy color key is going away. So converting this to a physical diagram, there's going to be two steps. We're going to finalize what our primary keys are, because we have to. And two is we're going to assign data types. So we're going to start with our happy employee again. We're omitting the foreign keys because the relationships assume that they're going to show up. Normally, you don't include the foreign keys in the conceptual diagram because it's just assumed that they're going to show up. If you want to be really fancy, knock yourself out. You can put them in. You're doing nothing wrong by putting them in. It's just normally an ERD, 
at least an extended ERD does not include the foreign keys. If you go for like the super, super extended version, which there is like three different levels of ERD, but I've always called, I heard it called the an ERD and then an extended ERD. And the last one is just, you know, that's a variant of that where they include the primary keys. No, 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 I'm not requiring this because it, that wasn't in the slides. I'm not making you guys do anything. I'm just going to introduce you guys to that symbol now so that if ever you run across that kind of diagram in the future and you see like, like that, you're going to go, what the hell's with that? There is another symbol for the diamonds too, which is a double diamond. Uh, there's, a, there's a diamond box and a double diamond. A diamond box and associative entity, uh, which honestly, um, this one could have been drawn as an associative entity instead of a straight up weak entity. But there isn't an option for a weak associative entity. They decided, you know what, there's just so much we can put in there, that'll do. All right, so physical from that to a physical. So I'm going to start with the employee. And at this point in time, I'm going to start following naming conventions. So I'll try to make a point to write everything lowercase because that's just my personal preference. All right. In our employee table, we have an employee number. We have a name. And we have a salary. You will notice a few things where I've started dropping some of those prefixes like EMP number, EMP name, and EMP salary. I left EMP number because, you know, that one works. But if the column is called name and it's inside the employee table, it's pretty safe to say that's probably the employee's name. Don't include extra stuff that you don't need to. You're not going to lose points if you do it in the assignment. I don't care. As long as you're consistent. But this is my personal preference. When I do this for when I do this for a living, this is what I choose to do. Okay. So an employee number is probably going to be an integer. Person's name will probably be a var car, a variable character length. So we set, you know, a maximum length of some sort. I'm going to make it 75 because that'll probably handle most people's full names, except for, you know, people hyphenated names from Quebec that have two first names, two last names, and a middle name or two. I wish I was joking. I've seen it. Salary, I'm going to use a numeric. And when we were looking at our salaries earlier, it was like 87,500, I think was the number one salary. So if when you look at it, if we were to write out 87,500, Include the this the decimal places. We have a number that occupies one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaces. Is it possible that somebody will earn six figures? God help me, seven figures. Yes. So to be safe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What the hell? Let's bring it up to 10 just to be on the safe side in case somebody has like, you know, $20 million a year salary. Wait, there are CEOs that make that much money in Canada. All right, so this I'm going to use a numeric. And what it is, it's going to be a 10 comma 2. Let me explain to you the thinking behind the 10 comma 2. It is 10 long with two reserved for decimal places. So that's what a numeric 10-2 does. So now we've defined that. We are going to define the employee number as a primary key. The name is going to be not null. 
and I'm going to leave the salary as is. Maybe the person's been hired, but we don't know what the salary is. So when something's defined as a primary key, by default, it is not null. You cannot have nulls in a primary key. Therefore, I'm not going to write not null primary key because primary key is automatically not null. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just, just how it is. Okay. Next one we're going to do is our employee skills. We're going to have our employee name, number, I mean, and we know it's an integer because if we define it as an integer up here, it's going to be an integer down here. Can't mix match the data types. And we're going to call this one skill. And we're going to make that a var car 25 because that's probably pretty safe. Now, this only has, you know what, I need a little bit of room. Let me just move this over just a little. This is part of the primary key, but this is also a foreign key. Because it gets its value from the employee table, so it's a foreign key, participates as part of the primary key. And we're going to put in our crow's foot, like such. So. This side of the diagram is complete. Yay. Now, I'm going to put in, um, I'm going to do the project over here because I don't have a lot of room. No, I got to do project down. Time. Yeah, let's go here. And I started going uppercase. Project number is probably an integer. It's going to be our primary key. Description is probably. Now, this is the decision we have to make. Is it going to be a var car? Is it going to be a text? How much room do you want to allow for the project description? Realistically, there's probably should be a name column, but all we had was project description. So we're going to go assume that it's you know a short kind of field. So we're going to go with a var car 75 again. Now our project table is defined. So now we've taken care of this one, this one, and this one. So now we just got these two one, these two ones. What the heck was that? These two. So let's go do the time sh time entry. And we have a uh time sheet entry and an employee number now this is an integer this one's an integer this one's a primary key this one's the foreign key and we decided this was optional so like such. So the time entry has a primary key and a foreign key, but the second field doesn't all participate in it. So the last table we have is our project time, our timesheet entry versus the project. So we go, uh, let's call it project time. And in here we will have our uh, Time sheet entry, our project 
number, and the number of hours. Okay, we know that this was an integer. We know this one's an integer. And these two are both part of the primary key, but they're also foreign keys. Now, hours is our last thing we got left to do. We have to decide, are we gonna allow decimal places or only full hour entry? Okay. We should probably allow decimal places, usually one. So most companies will bill by the half hour. I've seen a few that do by the quarter hour, but even quarter hour is really excessively hard to deal with as an employee. It's like, I just worked on this for seven minutes. So should I round down or round up? So they'll end up rounding down and then adding seven minutes elsewhere because just so that it's easy to deal with. So realistically, we only need one decimal place. And as you, if you remember the original entries I had, they actually had big numbers, like 35 hours, seven hours. So what kind of entries are these? I have no idea. I just made up numbers. However, we probably want to use numeric because we want to have decimal places. We don't need a float. We don't need a double precision because who cares how much decimal places we need? It's actually a really short number. So we can just play safe and say, maybe they'll do a timesheet entry that's in the hundreds of hours because I have no idea what the system that generates this is. So we're going to use a numeric. And it's going to be a four comma one, meaning we can put in 99, 999 hours, 0.9 hours. So four digits with one reserve for the decimal place. And we just draw our final relationships. Like such. So we went from that mess of a table through a normalization process, through a conceptual diagram, all the way to a physical diagram. That is literally everything you were taught since week two, all in one example from start to end. So if you're curious about what is involved in database design, you just witnessed the entire process in and exactly one hour. So, any questions before I take a picture of these boards and then, you know, erase them to be nice for the next prof? Put click. click. Yes. Okay, if you are doing a standard ERD, you don't need to do this. You start adding the attributes, you're falling into extended ERD diagram land. If you're going to put these, you're going to put those. But that literally is the, the answer to the question. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Decimal numeric is the same thing. So in MySQL, you can actually type in the word numeric if you want. It'll work. MySQL, numeric data type, and decimal data type are the same thing. They're aliases of each other. Now, there's a few other data types that are aliases of each other. But essentially, uh, if I remember right, uh, single precision and float are the same, and double and something and real are the same. I might have those backwards, but I never really deal with those numbers, so that's why I'm a little confused. 
not the same thing. MySQL 8 sort of brought Booleans. They're kind of real, um, but they're not. Every other database server on the planet other than MySQL supports true Booleans. In actual fact, they are triphase Booleans, which people think, well, Boolean means one or one or the other. No, it's triphase because it has yes, no, and null, which means yes, no, I don't know. So Booleans in most database systems have three phases. MySQL, just being the special child that it is, uses something called tinyint1, a one-byte integer. What does that allow you to store? No, and then nine versions of yes. Normally, we use one and zero, one for yes, zero for false, but I have actually seen the case of somebody putting in two, three, or four in a Boolean field because apparently that was slightly more true. Then it's not a Boolean anymore, it's a freaking integer. But in MySQL, if you're doing a Boolean, you're going to use a tiny int one, a length of one, tiny integer. It'll let you store from zero to nine. And you're actually going to store zero and one. Postgres, if you use a true Boolean, will let you use the word true or false as keywords, or T and F. Uh, older versions will let you also put in zero or one, but they've stopped allowing that because it see issues with MySQL and having multiple versions of what something can be. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, it's true or false. Oracle, I have no idea. I haven't played with Oracle enough to be able to tell you. Okay. Any other questions? That is a choice you can do. You can just go with specific constraints saying, you know, the foreign key cannot be null. Or if you want to get fancy and actually define an actual constraint saying age must be greater than zero, it's sub buried somewhere in the table constraints. I'm not too worried about it. That's cool, because technically not null is a constraint. Okay, going once, going twice, three times. That's it, folks. I'll be back here next week for the midterm. Oh, yes, for the assignment. Don't forget, you have to actually show it to me in person during your lab period. If you're in different lab periods, Try to coordinate so that you, you both go to the same lab period. That means you don't need to go to your other lab period. And if that does not work because both you're supposed to be in a math class during taking an exam or whatever, email me ahead of time so that I know. And at least send, you know, whoever's going to do the best job to, the, to talk to me. The demo takes under five minutes. It's more or less of, I look at your diagram and go, why did you choose to do this? Why is this like this? Those kinds of questions. I might give you some feedback saying that was kind of special. That's it. Now you're free to run.